Okay, so Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania is now out to own Digital E, and after re-watching the movie, I thought I'd do a breakdown of the insane details in the film that I haven't seen in other videos. This isn't going to be a scene by scene thing, but rather it'll cover the most in-depth ones and go over how they connect to the MCU and the greater Marvel Universe. Thank you, Spider-Man! Now one of the coolest scenes in the film involves Scott travelling into a probability storm on a subatomic level. Down here we see as he creates multiple variants depending on what choices that he makes. Huge shit outs to Canadian Lab for pointing out that a really cool way to start this notion is the fact that when Scott takes a step, a version of him pops out behind him. Him taking a step forward is him making a choice, and thus there's an alternate version of him that didn't end up doing this. However, things go way beyond this, and it actually ties nicely in with the previous Ant-Man and the Wasp film. In that we learn that the character Ghost had ties to the Quantum Realm, and after seeing this film, it's pretty obvious that she was tied in with some kind of probability storm. There's a brilliant moment in the trailer that discusses the Quantum Realm, and during it it also shows how Ghost's abilities work. You open up the quantum realm. That's when this crazy could be ghost who like walks through walls and stuff. Stole your tech. If you look closely at this moment of her walking through the door, you can see that another version of her pops out the back, and this looks similar to how one appears from Scott. This is a version of her that opened the door, whereas the main one we have doesn't, and thus it's showing the two possible outcomes like what we get with Scott. Now this is also a domain in which reality itself is formed, and it's at this subatomic level that branching timelines are created. Particles coexist in a stable phase relationship. If the system is interfered with, that stability becomes chaos. In other words, the object in question would be both in and out of phase with multiple parallel realities. Dealing with reality also means that we get certain rules, and we see a giant version of Ant-Man turning into ribbons at one point. This is a similar effect to what happened with Reed Richards in Multiverse of Madness, and this was because Wanda's powers are tied in with reality. Now, Upon approaching the rings, we also see that they have strange markings and glyphs on them. They look extremely similar to the ones that appeared in the Eternals, and as we know, they were created by the Celestials. The Celestials also created the universe as well, and it's possible that these markings and glyphs are actually tied in directly with them. I've recently gone back to both Blade Runner movies for the channel, and all the Nexus 6 replicants in that have serial numbers on them at a subatomic level. I'd love it if we discover that this was something similar here, with Celestials placing markings and codes on things further down you get as a sign of their craftsmanship. Now eventually, Scott is saved by Hope, and behind her we can see multiple versions all coming in. Eventually these and Scott go back into the original, and this is symbolic because it shows the only goal they have at this point. Had they stayed apart, then there would have been conflict in them, but them all coming together at once cements that the only choice Hope wants to make is to save Scott. Scott comes together because all he wants to do is save his daughter, and this beats the variants that were caused by the storm. Now, this probability storm also explains why Kang didn't venture down there. The last thing he wants to do is create more variants, as this will in turn create more versions of him that he has to fight off against. Come the end of the movie, we do meet the Council of Kangs, and this is the scene that's ripped right out of their first appearance. That was in Avengers 267, and the giant crowd shot includes some of the alien variants that popped up in that panel. However, at the centre of it all is Rama Tut, what I believe is the Scarlet Centurion, and also their leader who's known as Immortus. In the comics, this is the oldest version of Nathaniel Richards, and at some point all the Kangs eventually turn into him. Rama Tut is one of the first versions of the character, and he actually travelled back in time to ancient Egypt in order to become a great pharaoh. A huge shout out to new rock stars for pointing out that Moon Knight actually had an easter egg related to him, and it's clear that all these versions have had something to do with the MCU at some point. Now we learn that the Kang we meet in this movie is actually known as the Exile, and it's possible that we've had a nod to him in the MCU already. Around the arena, we can catch three statues, and we know that in He Who Remains Castle and Loki that there were some there too. These were of the three timekeepers, which could represent the three members of the Council of Kangs. There was a fourth statue there as well, but we couldn't tell who this was because it was smashed up. Big few time, few time, few time, few time. But it's possible that this was actually the exiled Kang, hence why it was broken up into several pieces. This could also cement the fact that he who remains is actually an elderly version of the exile who we end up meeting throughout this movie. The three main Kangs probably built the Great Castle as a place to look over the timelines, and then I think He Who Remains won, destroyed all the other timelines, and then took over this location as a place to watch over everything. This is why there's that destroyed statue, but just the one version of Kang remaining instead of three. 
Now their goals are also the same too, with the Exile saying that he wants to destroy almost all of the timeline so he can stop all of the incursions. He says the multiverse is being destroyed because of the chaos caused by them, and thus he wants to put an end to the destruction that they bring. I saw their chaos spreading across realities. I saw the multiverse, and it was dying, all because of them. However, it's also important to bear in mind that Kang also wants to be a conqueror that rules over all. Now before he was cancelled, Jonathan Majors actually talked about basing this version of Kang on Alexander the Great, who much like him built his own dynasty. Known as the Archaea Dynasty, his realm was so big that the sun never set on it. It's said that when Alexander saw the breadth of his domain that he wept because there were no more worlds left to conquer, and I could actually see this being the case with He Who Remains too. He seems like a bored man who spends his time sitting around in his castle because he's at a point where he has nothing left to do. It's very similar to how we found Thanos in Endgame, and they may potentially bring this across to the MCU as well. Now when He Who Remains was telling the story about all his variants, we actually saw him demonstrating the multiverse by having timelines on top of timelines. This is brought across later on when Kang's explaining incursions to Janet, and they may have used a similar explanation method to show they're one and the same. We can also catch Kang standing in the centre of a ring, and this echoes he who remains telling his origin story in which he stood inside one as well. Although Kang is seen as the bad guy, he's very much just doing the thing that we know he who remains accomplished, and Marvel painting him out as a hero is actually hinted to us in the logo. As always, the Marvel Studios intro is back, and every single version of this only ever has heroes in it. That seems to be the case here too, with Shuri now being added in it, along with he who remains. Now, a nice design detail can be seen in Kang's chair, and just like how the timelines are shown by He Who Remains, we can see his chair's design as a circular ring around the outside of it, with a circular chair in the middle, similar to how the centre of the universe is depicted. Time being a ring is also very important as well, as it shows that it all loops around, so the things with He Who Remains and Kang will continue to happen, because they are relying on each other to happen in order to happen. Lots of timey-wimey, wibbly-wobbly stuff, and all of Kang's tech deals with circles, which we see throughout the movie. Later on, we catch his soldiers working on their monitors, and all of the overlays have circles on them. When we get a proper look at Chronopolis, we can also see circles exist in all the infrastructure, showing how much this shape has influenced Kang. Now, earlier we talked about Reed Richards, and Kang is actually thought to be one of his descendants. They seem to confirm this is the case in the MCU as well, as the versions that come in warp using the same portal tech to what he had in the Multiverse of Madness. When they come in, you might also notice there's a guy on the right standing in a suit. It's possible that this is actually Mr. Griffin, who we've already had a nod to in Loki Season 1. At one point, Kang came in masquerading as a businessman named Griffin, who claimed to be the CEO of Kang Industries. We've already seen the name Kang before, and it could be spotted on the Avengers Tower as we move through the void. That episode also showed us Yellow Jacket's helmet, and as we learn in this film, he was scooped up by Kang to become MODOK. Don't show the butt, mate. Do not show the f***ing butt. Anyway, as we know, the Void is where he who remains casts things off, and it's possible that he threw the armor down there at some point. Now, if you're enjoying the video so far, we'd massively appreciate the thumbs up button, as it helps us in the algorithm, and it also lets us know you'd prefer to watch this over the other sh** we put out. Looking at you, Watership Down and Unexplained. Dear me. Now, you can also support us by picking up our Ant-Man Size Matters t-shirt over at our Shop Zero edition. It sells lots of merch that goes directly to the channel, and, and it basically helps videos like this get made. It's linked as the top comment, and we'll move on to that because I'll stop spamming you. Now, the movie opens with Janet discovering Kang, who's crash-landed in the quantum realm. From here, we cut to Scott in San Francisco, which is also where a lot of Shang-Chi ended up taking place. Might even be this, this bus that he had a fight on me. It's not. But uh, the, both films feature beacons, and the rings around Kang's chair also resemble the Ten Rings. Now over the top of this, we can hear the theme from the sitcom Welcome Back Cotter, and this is actually playing off the back of the last movie in which we had Come On Get Happy by David Cassidy. This was used for the Partridge family, and thus we have this sitcom idea laid throughout both films. Although these aren't insane details, the reason I'm bringing them up is because of how they play into the ending. We get a similar scene to this with Scott walking down the street, and now we can hear that the song's used again. Everything seems like it's okay, but the production team actually do some really subtle things to hammer home the idea that Kang's slowly seeping his way into Scott's mind. That final walk is awash with green, and we can also catch multiple people that are wearing purple. These are both of Kang's colours, and we can see a woman as she steps off the pavement wearing purple, one with her dog in a pram, 
And yeah, just lots of people wearing purple and green. Now there's actually a couple that walk past him at one point, and then they appear further up the street. I've seen theories that this could show time travel or something, which I don't know about that. I think it's just a continuity error, but the constant combo of purple and green helps to add to the paranoia. Now he gets Scott meeting with Jimmy Woo when he busts out a sleight of hand trick, which makes a card appear just like how Jimmy did it in One Division. Jimmy learned sleight of hand for that because he was obsessed with Scott doing it in Ant-Man and the Wasp, and as I've been saying, it's all connected. But the fact they grabbed dinner actually calls back to that movie, because Jimmy said, Did you want to grab dinner or something? I mean, because I'm free. Yeah, come on. You also get a cameo of my man from the Watcher YouTube channel. That should have been me. It should have f***ing been me. Anyway, we see Scott at Baskin and Robbins and can catch him winning an Employee of the Century award. We actually see his photo, and if you zoom in, you might notice that his name badge says Jack, which was the alias he used in that original film. This was actually a little nod to Paul Rudd's real life son, who he wanted to give a shout out to in that movie. Now, speaking of shout outs, we can see on the back of Scott's book that there's a quote from Bruce Banner and also Christine Everhart. You might recognize Christine's name, and she did a big spread on Tony Stark in the first Iron Man film. Well, she did quite a spread on Tony last year. And she wrote a story as well. It was very <clears throat> impressive. That was good. Ever Hart had fans for Ever Hard, and for f**k's sake. And she also did an exclusive interview with Scott, which can be found on YouTube. Now, you can buy this book in real life, and it was actually given lip service to in Wakanda Forever, and mention of it could be seen along the Anderson Cooper ticket. Now as the camera goes into the bookshop, we can also see a sign outside that says the Avengers and then blank, Thanos. Guessing that this said killed, but they want to keep it family friendly and make Scott seem like a nice guy. Now though things seem to be going good, we are reintroduced to Cassie Lang who's up in jail. We find out that she was helping at a homeless protest and this was for people who were evicted during the blip. This is a similar sort of thing to Falcon and the Winter Soldier and in that we joined the Flag Smashers who'd been left as refugees due to them being brought back five years later. This is kind of on Scott in a way, and I do like how they start Cassie off in a jail cell, much like how he was introduced in that first film. This shot is also very similar in composition to the van one from Ant-Man and the Wasp, but Scott's now in Hank's seat being the disapproving adult. He doesn't think they should be messing around in the day-to-day -day stuff, and it's nicely building off the back of that because Hank was doing the same. A huge hit out to our editor Matt for pointing out the reason the planet might have bounced back so quickly could be down to hope. We discover that she's been using Pym Tech to help with deforestation, and this is also when across into food production. The Earth would suddenly have over 3 billion more mouths to feed, so they'd need someone like this who'd help leading the charge. You might also notice that the company is now called Pym Van Dyme, instead of just being Pym Tech because Hope's now the CEO. Now we see this food production coming in full effect come the next scene with a pizza getting doubled in size. Peyton Reed actually said that this was an odd of the Back to the Future scene from the second film, in which they did something similar with a pizza oven. Now Scott of course brought up Back to the Future in Endgame. So Back to the Future is a bunch of bullshit? I bet they do a bit of a deeper cut to that movie later on, when we see his daughter go big. They talk about getting citrus cravings. But I really want like a lime. Right? Citrus, it's weird, I know. Citrus. And this calls back to two moments in the MCU. At the airport, after the giant man scene, Scott asked if anyone had orange slices. Does anyone have any orange slices? And when Hawkeye returned from the quantum realm, Scott also rushed over with some orange slices, which could be seen clearer during a deleted moment that was shown in the TV spots. We can also catch a world's best dad mug, and this is a call back to the world's greatest grandma trophy from the previous film. Anyway, in the quantum realm, they encounter the rebels, who are based slightly on the characters the Micronauts. For the movie, they've combined elements of the Negative Zone and Microverse with M, and have also adapted Krylar, who appeared when Hulk travelled to the Dimension in his 156th issue. Now, in a nice bit of attention to detail, we can actually catch a miniature sun following Cassie and Scott ju just over their shoulders, which then transforms into the big hulking guy after making its attack. With Janet and Co, we watch as she explains the Quantum Realm, and this actually pulls from a deleted scene from the prior Ant-Man and the Wasp movie. There are worlds here. Worlds within worlds. Worlds upon worlds, entire civilizations, far more than we ever theorized. Now eventually, Scott and Cassie are taken before Verb, who's voiced by David Dasmalchian. Amongst his followers, we can also catch a group of people who all have coloured rock heads. I have seen on Twitter that this could actually be remnants of the Infinity Stones, because as Thanos said, he reduced them to atoms. 
They do still need to exist on some level for reality to still function, so they may be down in the quantum realm, out of reach of those on the surface. Nice little catch. Now Verb also asks how many holes he has, and he's sad because he's not got any holes, but at the end he gets them, yeah? Because it's good writing. Do you understand how it's good writing? Now speaking of writing, later on Hank Pym talks about how he dated a woman called Linda. This name is actually Jeff Lovness's real life's mother's name, and originally Linda was going to be played by Jennifer Coolidge. Nice segue there, and as Janet and Cole fly out, we can catch a mural of Kang on the wall, showing how he rules over this domain. This is then signified by the blue glowing orbs and rings, which are of course in line with his tech. Now during the tour, Janet mentions Subatomic Air, which is actually a solar system from the comics that exists down in the microverse. You also see some of Kang's forces, and later on Quaz reads their mind, which proves that they're human. Possible that these are actually earlier versions of the TVA agents who've had their memories wiped so that they can function as slaves for Kang. Eventually, we come face to face with him, and though it's a bit obvious that he's talking about killing Thor, saying the one with the hammer, he could even mean Jane Foster, or potentially Throg. Hope you got out that jar, mate, and in Loki, Throg was sentenced to the void along with all those other Loki variants. So now everyone on Twitter is losing it going, how, how did this version of Kang beat Thor if he's losing the ants? There are versions of Thor that aren't as strong as the one that we know. Now before that though, we get Modok, which <laughs> don't know if I can defend this, uh, but if you, if you look away from the face, for, for just take your eyes away from the face, you might notice that there's a heart rate monitor in the middle of his chest. This actually ends up turning red and flatlining at the end when he dies, which is a nice way to say goodbye to this amazing character. Now learning about Kang and his backstory is easily my favourite scene in the film due to the performances we see. This very much feels like it's building off the back of the cave scene in Iron Man and we have her working away with her ally, similar how Tony did it back then. Both were trying to escape their confines, but whereas Tony got away, Janet doomed herself to remain there to stop Kang getting out. Now in flashback we see Kang wiping out timelines and catch a man disintegrating which appears similar to how people disappear in Loki when they're hit with one of the TVA sticks. The scars on his face also dominate his look and in the comics they were given as a way for Kang to remember who he was and who he's destined to be. Now the new origin story forum titled Only Myself Left to Conquer dealt with a young Nathaniel coming across his older version and he did whatever he could to stop himself from becoming him. The scars seal this fate though, and Kang's rebellious side of course leads to the incoming war that he's trying to avert. Now Kang also later calls Cassie Jellybean, which is a nickname Janna gave to her as a child showing how close they actually were. Either way, it leads to a big battle between the good guys and Kang, and we basically get a dictatorship versus socialism metaphor. Yay! Now there's lots of honey I shrunk the kids mirroring in here, with the ants helping our heroes to escape. Modok learns not to be a and Scottles uses a giant platform as a shield, which is a callback to his idol Captain America. They seemingly defeat the greatest threat in the multiverse using ants, but he returns before they can get back to the surface. Now one thing I noticed is that we get a big boot stomp from Kang that had me thinking of this. Ant. Boot. Kang is kicked in the multiversal engine, but in the comics the rule is that if you never see a body, then the character's not dead. Who knows if we will see Majors again as well, and at this point of making this video, there's been no word from Marvel over what's going on. You, you know what I'm talking about, that controversy. Uh, I don't want to get to pull the video down because we, we were having fun. But yeah, at the moment, we don't know what's happening. We do know though that Kang will be back, and there's even a nice little nod to him in the final few scenes. As I mentioned before, purple and green dominate the last scene, and in the restaurant we can also see his colours return once more. The balloons are big and purple, and the cake itself is bright green. Now we do have Magus as Victor Timely in that second post credit scene, with him being a variant that travelled back to the dawn of the 20th century to build an entire town around him. The credits also say Kang will return, and this version that we see here may potentially be the one we meet in the movie masquerading as Victor Timely. That's for another Timely video though, and we will of course be covering Loki Season 2 when it releases online. In the meantime though, I'd love to hear your favourite easter eggs that popped up in this movie. Again, I tried to make these ones that I haven't seen in other videos, but I'm sure there's lots of things that I've missed, so you know, it's your time to shine baby. Now, as a thank you for doing that, we are in a competition right now, in giving away the Quantumania Steelbook to 3 subscribers on the 15th of May. All you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the movie, and you know what, just drop any comment and you'll be entered. 
Now, if you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out one of our breakdowns on screen now. You want a mature movie, don't you? You don't care about this comic stuff. Uh, so, yeah, go watch our later on a breakdown on screen. Much better than this video. And uh, I'll see you over there right after this. By the way, thanks for sticking through the video. I've been Paul, and you take care of yourself. Peace.